Today's generation of kids are struggling in school. Teachers across the country are sharing TikToks discussing how their Gen Alpha students, those born between 2010 and 2025, are unable to read and not performing at their grade level. I teach seventh grade, they are still performing on the fourth grade level. I also teach seventh grade and we have kids that have math grade level equivalents of first and second grade, third grade, many at fourth grade, very few at grade level. I need y'all to get how serious the situation is. Today I have a test. I have students who don't want to show up for the test because they cannot read on grade level and they know the test is going to be hard. We are in a crisis mode in American schools. On TikTok, if you search Gen Alpha can't read or write, you'll see videos with over 400 million views. And with recent reports revealing that half of US students started the 2022 to 2023 school year behind grade level and reading and math scores among 13 year olds in the US have fallen to their lowest levels in decades, it seems like the panic we're seeing on TikTok is actually warranted. But a lot of the online discourse isn't addressing the real problem and the real reason that kids are falling behind in school and why it's worse than you think. obvious cause that people are discussing about why kids are falling behind in school is the pandemic and technology. The pandemic forced many children to have to learn from home as opposed to being in the classroom. And when you're learning from a computer versus learning from a real life teacher in a real life classroom, obviously the quality of learning is different. I remember as a kid that I would most definitely go on spark notes occasionally to get the summary of the books that I didn't want to read online. But today's generation of kids are literally growing up in a generation where a AI can do your homework. Kids aren't going to the library anymore and combing through pages and pages of books in order to get the information that they need to complete their assignments. They're just hopping online and they have easy access, instant gratification to be able to have whatever they're looking for. When it's easier to find, you're not going to be learning and soaking up the information in the same way when you're not having to work to get to that information. A lot of people have pejoratively dubbed Gen Alpha as the quote, iPad generation as a result result of this instant access to technology. They're saying that they're the generation whose parents just hand them an iPad instead of actually handing them a book. But it goes a lot deeper than that. We're currently living in a culture of anti-intellectualism, a culture that rejects education and learning and seeking out information the hard way. And anti-intellectualism is more prevalent than ever in the age of social media. Gen Alpha is the first generation to have never known a world without smartphones or social media. And it shows. In today's world thinking critically is something that is not valued even for me as an adult who takes time to analyze culture and the implications of media to always find the deeper meaning and deconstruct the world around me I can't tell you how many times I've gotten comments where people are like it's not that serious it's not that deep so we are living in a culture where people don't want to look beyond the surface level and it's in fact something that people shame you for in this social media age people no longer want to think growing up in the first generation where anti-intellectualism reigns supreme only breeds people who are uninformed. Their parents are uninformed and so are they. A lot of these kids who can't read at the grade level, guess what? Their parents can't read at adult levels either. And so this lowest common denominatorism that we see that's so prevalent in American society only breeds a generation of people that are more concerned with following the latest TikTok trend than actually following what's going on in their books. It's not just the kids who are addicted to technology either adults are obviously addicted to technology we're chained to our phones and so our kids emulate what they see us doing late stage capitalism is yet another reason why kids are falling behind their grade level educators agree that supplementing your child's education at home is the key to their success they say that within the confines of a 50 minute lesson in the classroom that's not enough for the child to effectively learn and digest things parents should be going over their children's assignments and homework and lessons at home with them to really reaffirm that in their brains we need to be reinforcing the same stuff that teachers teach in class at home. Because tests are hard and they can't read on grade level, they're going to engage in problem behavior, all because of something that can be easily avoided by working with your children at home to supplement what they're learning in school. 
because 50 minutes is not enough time to teach your child a lot of stuff. It has to be reinforced. The problem here, though, is that a lot of parents are working day in and day out and don't have the bandwidth or the time to help their kids with their schoolwork at home. And I know what some people might be thinking. Capitalism has always been here. What's changed? What's changed is we are on the brink of a recession. Inflation is through the roof. The cost of living is higher than ever. And so parents are working more and more hours. Some are even having to work multiple jobs at once and they don't have time to properly supplement their child's education. On this channel, I talk a lot about the culture of overwork and how that affects your mental well-being. So we have to take into consideration for parents that they are under a lot of pressure having to go through the stressors of being at work. By the time that they get home, yes, they do want to hand their child an iPad because they want some peace and quiet. They want time to themselves. It's easier said than done to actually make time and have the energy to have the bandwidth to really properly supplement your child's education. It's sad to say it, but it's actually a privilege to be able to have that time to dedicate to your child on a daily basis. So instead of blaming the parents for not taking the time to supplement their children's education at home, we have to take a closer look at our work environment since the stressors of having to hold down multiple jobs, to work multiple shifts, how that leads to parents not being able to have time to effectively nurture their child's education and a lot of kids are experiencing tumultuous home lives that are a result of living in poverty that prevent them from being able to effectively learn people are struggling financially now more than ever when you don't have the resources to have a quiet home where you can study that can aid in you struggling in school there's also a national teacher shortage why because teachers are paid so abysmally that fewer people are choosing the profession Hey Rats, I'm a teacher and I can barely afford to pay rent with my salary. My salary bi-weekly is basically my rent minus $500. Guess how much my car is? $400. Guess how much insurance is? $100. Oh yeah, that's right. You do the math. I'm left with owing money at the end of the month. That's not even with groceries. Every single month I am transferring money out of savings into my checking and I am not Um, just had the realization in the car that I'm actually going to go into debt if I continue being a teacher. And so we have to take into consideration how economic conditions lead to students struggling in school. Placing the blame solely on children does not get us very far, obviously, because children do not have their own agency. They're not in control of their own lives. Their parents and their teachers are in control. We have to acknowledge how adults are failing children too. We have teachers posting thirst traps in classrooms on social media. The priorities of teachers are not what they used to be either, and that's on us millennials. And some parents aren't helping either. Yes, late stage capitalism is an issue, but that does not let parents off the hook for bad parenting. I want to name that. There are parents out there that are not properly disciplining their children. There's parents out there who are not respectful of teachers. And that's also a problem as well. I'm calling out all the parents. If you're a parent and your child is in pre-K to elementary school, elementary school to high school, I'm calling you out. Having to teach and work with you guys as children has been the most traumatic experience of my life. I teach five-year-olds ballet, five-year-old girls ballet. I have a class of 10 students. They don't respect any authority. You ask them, can you stand in your designated spot? They're telling you no and shut up. They're throwing things at each other. They're throwing things at other people, other classmates. You say, can everybody sit in their spot? I don't want to, I'm not doing that. You don't get to tell me what to do. You're not my mom. You confront the parent. The parent tries to argue with you and fuss at you because you tried to reprimand and redirect their kid. I told a young little girl, please sit in your spot. You're not my mom, you don't tell me what to do. Okay. When her mom came to pick her up, I said, hey, your daughter's having a hard time following instructions and seven times today I've had to redirect her to just sit in her spot. Well, clearly she didn't want to sit. And mind you, this is a mom. Clearly she didn't want to sit right there. So, I mean, if she telling you she don't want to do something, why keep asking her to do it? You know she's not going to do it. What world do we live in? Like what in you guys' brain as a parent says, hmm, my kid not following any directions is a, is a great thing. It's not that serious. And y'all don't have a right to tell her what to do. It's sad. It's sad. It's really, really sad. And another thing that's heart wrenching is horrifying. It is horrifying. Your five-year-old daughters are asking to listen to Pound Town and Ski Yee. Your daughters, your five-year-old daughters are asking, can we hear Pound Town? I'm playing them Princess Tiana ballet music. And they are asking me, can we hear Pound? 
you guys' daughters are twerking at five. Five. Where is the parenting? Where is the boundaries? Where is the help? Y'all are not helping your kids. You're hurting them. This whole scenario reminds me of that episode of Abbott Elementary where Janine is having a meeting with that parent and expressing how poorly her child is behaving in school. And the parent is just like, you need to be a better teacher. Thank you so much for coming in. I know it's difficult to do in the middle of a work day. Oh, it's fine. I just had someone pick up the rest of my shift on short notice, but I'm here. I respect that, so I'll get right into it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been dealing with some issues with your son, Deshaun, since the beginning of the year, minor issues, and I've been managing them, but as the year has gone on, it's just gotten progressively worse. Worse? How? Oh. Well, it started off with like small things, like him calling out the answers without raising his hand, but you know, now it started to escalate to him throwing books and... The right answers are the wrong answers. Well, right or wrong, it's just disruptive to the other students. Mm -hmm. I see. And look, I know we both want what's best for Deshaun. So what do you want from me? <laughs> well, I thought... Thought what exactly? This wasn't my first option, by the way. As I've said, his behavior has been getting progressively worse and been trying to make sure he's having a successful time at school. And nobody's stopping you from doing that. He's kind of stopping me, actually. He's seven. You can't control a seven-year-old. Cassandra, it's not about control. You know, we're setting him up to be the best student he can be. And, you know, we're a team. We're not a team. And I don't see how he could be the best student that he could be with a teacher like you. Um, excuse me? And now my boss is calling. I took time out of my day, away from my job, to come down here to hear you complain about my son, and you're not even doing your job. I'm doing the best I can with your son. If this is the best that you can do, you are the worst teacher that I've ever seen. I'm sure a lot of teachers can relate to dealing with difficult parents. Both parents and teachers have the responsibility of being a support system for children. They have a responsibility to model good behaviors. They have a responsibility to discipline the children within reason. And it's up to us as adults to teach them right from wrong. It's up to us as adults to instill confidence in them. A lot of students of color in particular are underperforming due to their schools not having adequate funding to have the resources to be able to give them a high quality education. Because school districts with majority people of color students do not receive the same level of funding that majority white school districts receive. So I have to tell you, when I walk down this, I feel like I'm in a prison. I know, right? Doesn't it? Why would your kids want to come here when you, it looks like you're in a prison? Spend any time at all walking the halls of Baltimore's Franklin High with Cindy Smith. No AC, you can feel it. And you get a lesson in math that doesn't add up. So this is a floor that's actually collapsing. Look along the wall, you can see it's, it's dropped two, maybe even three inches. This, folks, is an actual lab for high school students. People attend lab in this classroom. We have a typical classroom, tack boards that are mass casework that needs to be replaced. Why can't the school district do better? Because we don't have enough money for it. ABS stations across the country went into deteriorating schools in high poverty districts with low property tax bases. We found those districts invested on average 40% less money in buildings than richer school districts, with even larger disparities between majority white and majority black school districts. And many state governments make the disparity worse. Our analysis of federal data shows that on average, these states give majority white school districts almost four times more money for capital investments than majority black districts. We saw it in Maryland. Baltimore City School District, with a black population twice as high as Baltimore County School District and lower per capita income, got $19 million from local property taxes for capital spending last year. Baltimore County, $201 million. That breaks down to $1,800 per student in the wealthier, less diverse district versus Baltimore City, where it's $244. That's seven times more. And when students have to go to school in poorly funded facilities, their grades suffer as well. On national tests in 2019, only 18% of black fourth graders scored proficient or above in reading compared to 45% of white fourth graders who scored proficient or above in their reading scores. There was a viral TikTok earlier this year where students from Carmel High School in Indiana were giving a tour of their campus and black and brown users were quick to point out the disparities in their own school facilities. This viral video which shows a group of students in Carmel, Indiana showing off their high school is an example of racism. Welcome to Carmel High School. Join us on a tour. This is the auditorium. This is the commons. This is the catwalk. This is the planetarium. I know you're wondering like, yo, how is this an example of racism? All right, let's talk about it. Predominantly white schools receive $23 billion more in funding than non-white schools. And it has everything to do with this country's racist past and present. Schools are primarily funded by property taxes, meaning if you live in a wealthier area, your school probably will look like that as well. Why the huge discrepancy? Well, you have the unresolved legacy of slavery, and you also have the unresolved legacy of Jim Crow policies.
When white folks started buying homes after the Great Depression in the 30s and 40s, the government was throwing money at them and giving them loans, whereas black families were denied and placed in red lines on real estate maps, which led to the creation of ghettos. So during that time, white families are able to build even more wealth with having that foundation of buying a home with a loan, having greater access to economic resources anyway and employment, which means they're paying a higher property tax rate, which means their schools will also then have more funds. The environment that you're learning in and the resources that you have access to makes all the world of difference in the quality of your education. So only when we address the underlying causes of why students are underperforming in schools, can we actually solve the problem? A lot of students with learning disabilities are not given the proper accommodations to have success within their education. It's assumed that the neurotypical way, that is the blueprint for everybody to learn by, but that doesn't work for everyone. Different people have different learning styles and a lot of these learning styles aren't being accommodated. Black neurodivergent and disabled students in particular are getting expelled and suspended at higher rates because their teachers don't have the tools to understand that they learn differently. It's written off as a behavioral problem. It's written off as being defiant. Instead of getting proper diagnoses and providing the accommodations that these students require. And they end up in the school to prison pipeline because a lot of the disability research and the framework was performed on white students. So when black students don't have the exact symptoms that white students show, they never get properly diagnosed. Again, they get dismissed and treated as though they're just behaving badly. A 2016 study study in the pediatrics journal found that black children showed symptoms of ADHD at a significantly higher rate than white children, but were diagnosed much less often. Studies have estimated that up to 40% of inmates in the US have ADHD. And a lot of black students who have learning disabilities are so often not diagnosed because it's doubly discriminating. It's bad enough that you have to deal with the reality of being black at being disabled to the list of marginalizing identifiers and you're doubly, you're multiply marginalized. And that's really hard for a lot of black parents, black children to have to deal with. And so they don't end up getting a proper diagnosis. Instead of writing these kids off as moral failures, we have to take a closer look at how our systems are failing our children and stop expecting every child to learn in the same way. When we have these viral conversations on social media, a lot of the nuance and complexities get lost. The real work toward helping our students to succeed is not going to happen online. It has to take place offline and in our actual communities. We have to remember that we're talking about children here. And it's up to us as adults to create systems of support in order to help them to achieve success. And success looks like being accommodating of different learning styles. Success looks like not ridiculing children and writing them off. Recognizing Recognizing that the society that we live in, the homes that they may be living in might be tumultuous. The schools that they're attending are underfunded. We have to recognize that yes, technology is impeding on our children's ability to actually learn and soak up information. That technology is training them to be a copy and paste generation that is not actually taking away a valuable lesson, but is just memorizing for memorizing sake to pass the test. But it's up to us as adults to do things like limiting their screen time and giving them the book instead of the iPad. But in that same vein, teachers have to make reading books and learning actually feel like something that is enjoyable and not something that you do to be punished, not something that you do as a chore. We also have to support our youth through asset-based framing, bringing out the best in our students, not bringing out the worst, talking about what are their strengths? What are they doing right? There are so many causes and so many solutions that I can sit here all day telling you about, but I definitely want to hear from you all in the comments down below. What do you guys think that we can do in order to help our children to succeed in the education system? And if you like this video, definitely give it a thumbs up. And if you really liked it and you want more content like this, definitely hit that subscribe button and I'll talk to you all next time.